Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Pianci. I'm here as usual with my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm doing well, Cass. How are you? I'm good. We have the privilege to be joined by Miss Molly White, who is working on a, an amazing project called Web3 is Going Great. I think there's a hint of sarcasm there. How are you today? And can you just kind of describe your current role in regard to, I guess, Web3, the vague idea of Web3? Sure. Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for having me. I, I think you probably know I'm a huge fan of your podcast. So I guess my role recently, at least, has been sort of as a person observing from the sidelines uh, some examples of how Web3, you know, cryptocurrencies and NFTs and DAOs and everything that's sort of being smushed together into this one concept isn't actually going so great. <laughs> you have a grift counter um, that is... <laughs> is in the corner of your website. If anyone wants to go there, web3isgoinggreat.com. And in the lower right-hand corner, there's just flaming flaming dollars. And I think that's a beautiful representation of most of what we've been seeing in regard to all of this. I know you have mainly been focused on Wikipedia up until now, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I so I've been a Wikipedia editor for a really long time, and that's sort of been a prevailing hobby of mine for a long time. It's not what I do professionally or anything like that, but that is sort of how I uh, get my sort of encyclopedic urges out. <laughs> <laughs> and I assume that that might have something to do with how you ended up here talking about NFTs and Web3 and DAOs and all of this? To some extent. I mean, I... I think it sort of becomes a habit when you do something like uh, editing Wikipedia for a really long time that that just sort of changes how you approach things. And, you know, I think there's sort of a, a researcher gene that, that is uh, among us. But yeah, I mean, Wikipedia has sort of been an interesting um, topic when it comes to Web3 because there are a lot of people who see Wikipedia and go, ooh, they should make that a token, you know, <laughs> and, and think that that is just the, the best new idea in Web3. Uh, I've been seeing that for a really long time, and it's really irritating to me personally. <laughs> I uh, I mean, the, isn't, what is it called? Everpedia or whatever Everpedia. it was? Isn't that, wasn't that like a Brock Pierce Everpedia. project already? Yeah, yeah, yeah blockchain <laughs> capital was fun in that. Yeah, shocked to see that that didn't take off <laughs> so well. Molly, what in specific motivated you to start this project and invest what I imagine is a considerable amount of time into documenting all these specific cases of how Web3 is going great? Well, so, I mean, I work in tech in real life. And so, you know, it's hard, I think, as a software engineer, just to sort of escape the tech Twitter discussions and your friends showing you their JPEGs and, and all that when it comes to the Web3 thing. But I think it's one of those things where like, you know, Bitcoin's not new. Blockchains are not new. These have been around for a really long time. And it's not like, you know, 2021 is the first that I was hearing about them. But it was sort of the first that I was seeing them be repackaged into this sort of shiny new idea that like anyone can get rich with Web3. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to go set up your own computer to go mine Bitcoin to like make a, a bunch of money off of this. You too can sort of get in on the grift. And when I started to see some of these Web3 projects that were really targeting, I would say, you know, sort of the average lay person, you know, not the Bitcoin nerds or the, the people who are already interested in very risky investments, but like, you know, the, the people who are watching the Super Bowl and seeing the Coinbase commercials or the, you know, the people being uh, convinced to put their retirement money into cryptocurrencies. Once I started to see those, you know, Web3 starting to sort of target those demographics, that's when I was like, mm, maybe this isn't something that I can just sort of stay apathetic about and sort of take the position of like, well, it's not for me, but it's not hurting anyone, you know, because it, it really looked like it was starting to hurt people and it has hurt people. What do you find to be the biggest like misconcept public misconception about NFTs and Web3? Like what what is it that you're having to push back against the most? 
This is maybe more of a pet peeve than anything, but one, I think, misconception that has made its way into the language around, you know, reporting on these, I even find myself using the word, is people talking about NFTs and cryptocurrencies as investments. You know, people invest in NFT projects or they invest in this new meme coin. And it's like nowhere in the world would someone discuss the kind of risky behavior that's happening in Web3 projects as an investment. Like that's like talking about going to the casino and saying, I'm going to go invest my paycheck at the casino. Like, no, that's not what that is. You're gambling. That's what that is. You're gambling. And so I really don't like that because, you know, people are, are really trying to make it seem like a reasonable thing to do with your money versus, you know, just a, a joke or a, a, something to do with that extra 10 bucks. Maybe it'll, you know, take off, maybe it won't, but it won't actually make a huge difference in your life if it doesn't, you know, that's what I really, really dislike. I think that's a really excellent point. And it's something we kind of talked about when uh, Ben McKenzie and Jacob Silverman were able to come on the show. And they referred to it as casino capitalism, where so many things nowadays are marketed to the masses, not with a value proposition, ex- but purely on the chance that if you're right, you could get rich. And I think that's probably what drives a lot of the emotional responses you see to Web3 coverage. Often, I notice relatively milquetoast criticisms of things in cryptocurrency will be met with very spirited backlash by members of the community. And I think that has to be because these people are invested in or gambling and are sold on the narrative that this is their chance to make it rich. And I know I I love Web3 is going great. And I think it's doing a wonderful job of helping correct crypto's fruit fly length attention span by documenting all of these things and putting them all in one place. But I imagine you've gotten a uh, somewhat polarized response to it. How has that experience been for you in navigating that? Yeah, so... um... Definitely, definitely a polarized response Uh, there. You know, some people really like it. Some people even in sort of Web3 communities really like it, which which I actually have been happy to see. You know, it's nice that it feels like people in crypto and Web3 are like universally like really opposed to any sort of skepticism or criticism. But there are definitely some folks who who are willing to see that. And I think that's good. But yeah, there's definitely the, the, the people who are like, you clearly just don't understand how blockchains work or you. You haven't done your research or, or all these wild things and that you know i think that is sort of typical of the, the the crypto response you know to anyone who would dare question their magical blockchains you know so you know that's unfortunate i i think people talk about being in web3 for the technology they're really into the blockchain technology and in real life if you are investigating a new technology or if you're enthusiastic about a new technology, skepticism is really good. And criticism, (laughs) that's my new word. (laughs) Criticism is really good because it drives improvement, right? Like you can't, have a successful technology if no one is willing to say, wait, but what about this thing? What if that's a bug? Or what if we need to consider this edge case? You know, if I responded to my PR review and was like, no, you just don't understand. (laughs) You know, that's not a bug. That's, that's, you just don't understand it. (laughs) Software would go nowhere. And so seeing that in crypto is, is really baffling to me. My next response to someone who has comments about my code is just going to be have fun staying poor. I'm just going to tell them they're not going to make it. (laughs) Not going to make it. Yep. (laughs) You clearly don't understand why I messed up my, (laughs) my loop here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> my my next question like sort of relates to this. Uh, maybe a week ago or something like that, there was a thread by the one of the tech writers for the New York Times, and I feel like I'm seeing this kind of regularly right now, which is to see members of the media, journalists, kind of because I want to use this word, not for lack of a better word, but whinging uh, about how they can't spend money buying NFTs and crypto. I thought there were a couple interesting things about it, which was one, that his wallet clearly had like two or three Ether running through it at certain points. So, I mean, the New York Times is funding them buying and selling these things if they want to. And secondly... I don't quite understand why everyone thinks journalistic standards, which have existed for for hundreds of years, should 
change right now for NFTs and DAOs. But I was glad to see you call it out. <clears throat> glad to see you call it out, excuse me. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on that, because you you must be frustrated as well, just to have kind of said something. Yeah, I am enormously frustrated by that. Uh, you see it like, you know, in most reporting about like the stock market, if that reporter owns stock, half the time they're not even allowed to write about it. But if they do, they have to disclose it because like otherwise there's a huge incentive, you know, for these journalists to basically do what a lot of influencers are doing and like hold a stake in the project and then talk really good about it. And then it goes up and then they dump it and then everyone loses money. Like that's 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 not a new concept to crypto that's existed in the stock market, traditional finance, you know, for for ages. And so it's it's weird, but also unsurprising, I think, to see journalists do this in the sense that I feel like everywhere in projects that are like anything to do with blockchains and, and NFTs and cryptocurrencies, there's this sort of prevailing belief that just like regular standards, laws, regulations just magically don't apply. You know, you see it with copyright with a lot of these projects where they're like, oh, but it's an NFT, so I can just steal your work, you know, or like I can buy that Dune storyboard like that one Dow did and, and make a, you know, animated film out of it as if you can buy a book and make an animated film out of the book if you just go to the bookstore and buy one, right? Like that, it's like in the real world, that's not how that works. And it's not like cryptocurrency suddenly makes it legal to do that. So, you know, seeing the same thing where where journalists are sort of acting shocked that they can't engage in this behavior is like just unsurprising to me because it seems just constant. But yeah, I was I was disappointed to see that thread, you know, these are these weren't just like your sort of Forbes contributor where there's kind of a low bar to entry and it's like, yeah, you you probably, you know, you're okay at reporting but you're not necessarily a big name. These are like some of the biggest, you know, reporters out there. Kevin Roos is the one uh, who was commenting about this. And I recognized his name partly because I've cited him on Wikipedia for a decade or something like that. And I know the name from that. You know, he's like a big reporter on real concepts. But I also recognize the name because he was responsible for a very glowing, I would say, piece in the New York Times about this project called Pudgy Penguins, um, which is an NFT project which I recognized because I had to write an entry about it when its founders tried to just make off with all the money that was in it. The Pudgy Penguins founders wanted to just like take all the money and then like sell the shell of the company to some other guy without actually like disclosing that that's what they were doing. It was very shady. Uh, the, the person involved, you know, who was going to buy the project noticed this and luckily and didn't do it. But like there was definitely some really shady stuff happening there. And so I was really surprised when he was talking about like, no, it's totally cool for, you know, journalists to hold these NFTs when like he himself had gotten these pudgy penguins NFTs, written a huge puff piece about it. They spiked, you know, when the, the New York Times published about them. Haven't done so great since then, you know, and I wonder <laughs> how many people bought in because they saw this, you know, New York Times, like, wow, this has to be legit. And then bought these NFTs and then they did very mediocre. The most disappointing part to me of that exchange was that you like cited this piece and he was like, oh, those pudgy penguins were loaned to me. I didn't own them. Like they were just loaned and then I gave them back. And someone responded like, why did you need to have them at all? And he was like, well, I thought I needed them for the discord. And it just kind of devolved from there. But the whole thing was like, wow, I feel like the whole point is being missed right now. Like you wrote a very positive article about this thing. And now the price is a lot lower after you wrote that glowing article and they're still using it. I think, I don't know if it was David Girard, but someone else pointed out that Coinbase was listing them or something on their NFT platform and was and it was like, check out our the article written about us in the New York Times. And you, you're just like, I, is there no shame? <laughs> is there no shame at all? And I, I guess the answer is no. I guess if you go back in time... <laughs> Anyway, it's probably no as well, you know, I, I don't know. 
Yeah, the thing that really startled me, too, was that, like, while he was writing the piece, you can go read the piece, and he says something about how the people in the Discord were so excited when he joined because they thought that a New York Times writer covering their NFT project was going to pump it. And I was like, at no point did that ring any alarm (laughs) bells for you about, like, maybe this isn't a great idea. Like, apparently not, but... He, he like wrote it into the piece, you know, clearly he didn't think that was a problem, but to the outside observer, that looks like it should have really set off some alarms, but he didn't seem to think so. His editor, I guess, didn't seem to think so. You know, they were willing to publish it. So that was shocking to me. That was, I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be my, the next thing I was going to bring up because it was so striking to like see a generally respected journalist who joins a discord and people are ecstatic because they think him joining is going to make them money. And so I really hoped that after he opened the piece with that, that there was going to be some pretty serious and substantive criticism, or at least like it would be addressed beyond a passing line in the article. And it was not. And that was very disappointing. Just it felt like Kevin in the New York Times failed to recognize that they were facilitating the early exit of the investors in this project, that they were unwitting allies of these people who eventually tried to rug pull. And it still seems like they're not willing to confront that reality. Absolutely. Yeah, I actually pretty recently added a reporting category to my web three is going to great site because I had, I had previously mentioned a couple of cases where like news outlets were tricked by fake pre- press releases and it was like walmart's gonna accept litecoin or something like that like a year or so ago and you know it pumped the price and then you know it turned out to be a fake and and whatever but um i sort of broadened the category that i was using for that to just encompass reporting in general because i think irresponsible reporting has been a huge part of what has has enabled Web3. You know, you've seen that BBC piece where they get made this really inspiring biography of this person who had just scammed a bunch of people. And apparently the BBC of all people, of all organizations, didn't do just a tiny bit of research into the project that this guy had gotten all this m- money out of um, to see that he had just totally pump and dumped it, you know, and they had to, they were embarrassed because they didn't do that. We've seen now today, yesterday, the Associated Press doing their god awful NFT project. And again, it's like, most people would probably question the ethics of, you know, monetizing photographs of human suffering that in no way benefit the subject of the photograph. But it's NFTs, so you can just do whatever you want, you know, and I, I hate seeing that. It it drives me bonkers because, you know, I think journalism is so important and, you know, being ethical in your reporting is so important. And then when, when cryptocurrencies are involved, it's like, we can just do whatever we want. That's what it seems like to me. It's clear that there's uh, a desire to have access, right? It's access journalism. And you feel like you're not in the club if people who have the NFTs or the cryptocurrency don't let you into the Telegram or the Discord or whatever. And I do think there's something to be said for this where we were, I don't remember who Bennett and I were chatting with, but um, I'm sure you're familiar with Zach XBT on Twitter. I feel like he's been doing an excellent job uh, calling out a lot of scams in the face of a lot of threats and a lot of people kind of just ignoring him. But it you wonder if that's enough, right? Like, and if you doing Web3 is going great is enough. If if these volunteers who are trying to do their best to self-regulate as close as we can get to that uh, in this, because I feel like all of us are probably pretty disappointed with how regulators have dealt with actual problems in the space that everyone can recognize. The question becomes like, what happens when you decide you're, you're tired of doing this for nothing. I I think that's, I mean, that's normally where journalism steps in, right? Like people are paid to ask the tough questions that people don't seem to be asking. That, that has existed for, you know, longer than the internet's been around for sure. And, uh, you know, that's not to say there aren't good journalists, you know, doing the work and being skeptical and doing critical reporting. There, There are definitely people who are, who are doing an amazing job. But I think the problem is that there's just so much money to be had to be 
positive about cryptocurrencies that it's just absolutely blinding entire, I mean, publications. It's not, it's not even an individual reporter issue, although obviously there are issues there too. But, you know, you see like CNBC, uh, which is a big name. Uh, and some of the stuff that they're reporting is just like, it might as well be a press release that they just print, you know, verbatim because it's so puffed up. And that, that really bothers me because there needs to be skepticism that's crucial and it's not happening. And so, you know, people like me are just doing what we can, you know, in our off hours to try to, to cover it or, you know, Zach or, or whoever there is, you know, and th there's podcasters who are not particularly well compensated for what they're doing, I'm sure, you know, and, and it's, it feels like this sort of grassroots thing largely, and it, it doesn't need to be, it shouldn't be. Do you ever think that maybe that's inherent to not just like, not just cryptocurrency, but maybe it's a problem in in finance, like maybe this is something that like no one wanted to listen to Harry Markopoulos when he was like, hey, Bernie Madoff is a giant fraud. Everyone was like, hey, shut the hell up. So I wonder if when assets, volatile assets, which I think I think it's fair to say that the stock market qualifies uh, in that realm as well and commodities largely, too, maybe if the market is going up, especially for an extended period of time, it starts paying less dividends to be critical at all. I mean, I think so. You know, you can make a lot. I think that's just generally true of things like cryptocurrency is you can make a ton of money by being very positive about crypto. And like, there's not a whole lot of money to be made from being critical of it. And so, you know, free market at work, I guess, you know, there's just not as many critics. But I think that that's why there need to be sort of outside ways that this is being enabled, like, you know, through news outlets paying their reporters, regardless of whether or not they're positive about crypto. But yeah, generally speaking, I would agree with you. I, I'm going to go on a just a slightly different direction. What do you hope Web3 is going great accomplishes? What is your goal with it? I just hope it draws attention from sort of, like I said, those lay people who are getting sort of these stars in their eyes about the, you know, the stories they're seeing in the news of the person making a million dollars from a $10 investment or, you know, the, the JPEG that they were airdropped and then suddenly they can sell for a huge amount of money. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that people can see that like, no, the fact that a couple of people are getting really rich off of this does not mean that most people are getting really rich off of this or that you're not going to get totally scammed by one of the enormous number of scammy projects out there. You know, some people have asked, you know, am I doing this because I'm hoping to like better the Web3 space? No, I mean, <laughs> I guess, you know, if Web3 has to exist, I would love for it to be better than it is. But I'm not, you know, hoping that there's going to be some utopian future with blockchains running everything that are just somehow better than they are now, because I, I don't I don't see a, a lot of potential in the technology. And so my hope is really just to benefit the people who might otherwise think it's a good idea to put their money into it. Yeah. As someone who's been in the uh, cryptocurrency critic field for a while, it is always striking how they're going to solve all the problems with blockchains next year. And then um, next year, they're going to solve them the next year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ethereum 2.0 with sharding is going live at by 2018. So I, I think perhaps, do you have any examples that really stuck out to you in your time covering Web3 so far of the gap between the promises and the reality? Boy, I feel like practically everything on the site is one of those, uh, you know, it's sort of a key feature of these projects to promise the world and then, you know, deliver very little. I think the, the, a good example from the Web3 site is the game Blockverse, which was going to be a blockchain-based game, and it raised a huge amount of money despite having no game implemented whatsoever. And the game that they were promising was already going to be built on Minecraft, an existing game. And then, but people put like an enormous amount of money into it for some reason. And then everyone, the, the, the founders just totally made off with it. And it's like, I guess vaporware is cool again, and you don't have to do a single thing to actually like legitimize your project. It's, it's unreal to watch that kind of thing. And, and when a game does put out like a beta 
or like a really early stage thing, people are blown away by it. Like we just saw that with the Titan Reach example, which in fairness started out as like a Kickstarter and, you know, not necessarily a cryptocurrency project. But when they were getting investments, people were so surprised that there was anything there at all that they were like, yes, let's buy into this, even though the 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 project team seemed kind of doomed from the start. And to close the loop on that, the project ended up totally tanking because the developer decided to take the magical, like, it's like the best thing in the world that could happen to a development team happened where an angel investor with a huge amount of money was like, here's an unlimited, like a blank check, go to town, build your sweet game. I'm not asking anything in return. You don't have to build it the way I like it. Just do your thing. Like that's too good to be true in basically any scenario. But the developer of the game decided to take that blank check and invest $150,000 into the Wonderland protocol, (laughs) which recently had an absolute disaster of a time, Uh, lost all his money. I think he also bought a Tesla with the the free money because that's critical in uh, crypto grifting. And uh, needless to say, when the investor found out, he pulled support for the project and it is no more. I think that I'm maybe I'm bringing this up just based on what something people ask us often as well. Obviously, what you're doing provides some sort of, I, I presume, educational value, right? Like you said, you're not trying to save anybody, but hopefully people are able to glean some sort of information from your website. Also, you have uh, your personal blog, mollywhite.net. That also contains kind of discussions about Web3 and blockchains and and all of that. I just wonder if you are going to try or expect to ever get compensated in any way. I know I noticed that there's no donation page. I noticed that there's no there's no way to uh, give you any money. I think Bennett and I have stuck to that as well because it seems like the least grifty thing you can do in crypto, basically. Like if you're actually talking about crypto and you're not asking for money, it's like it's hard to say you're a grifter, right? Yeah, so I've had a couple people ask that. And I will say I have some people have sent me money to, uh, you know, I have like Twitter tips on or whatever. And people have sent me like a couple bucks through there. And I probably will continue to accept that, but only to the extent that it covers hosting costs. So, you know, maybe I'll set up a donation page or whatever if if hosting ends up being expensive or whatever. But that's that's absolutely the most I will do. Because I think that's right. Like, you know, the, the biggest issue with talking about crypto is that... When financial incentives are in- involved, it changes the game. And this is something I've seen with Wikipedia as well. You know, we have had, there are people who are paid to edit Wikipedia on behalf of a company or a person or whatever to make them look good. And that's a huge, huge issue on Wikipedia because as soon as someone is being paid for their edits, that totally changes the game in a way that's just like basically fundamentally incompatible with how Wikipedia has to work. And I think the same is true in some ways with, you know, cryptocurrencies. Either you're being paid, you know, by someone who wants you to 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 shill their project or, you know, just generally improve the status of cryptocurrencies and you stand to benefit from that. Or, you know, there's the other side of that as well where people are shorting crypto or, you know, trying to trying to make a buck off of it doing poorly. And, you know, I'd just rather not have any of that entanglement, you know? <laughs> like it'd be nice to not have to pay the hosting costs, but I I don't expect I'm not gonna add ads. I'm not gonna monetize the site. I, I have no intentions of that. The uh the Wikipedia comment just made me think of a comment conversation I had with uh, David Gerard, who's also a Wikipedia editor, about how common it is, especially for cryptocurrency companies to do exactly what you're describing, where they hired these firms to try to go in and edit the pages. And uh, David's ended up in a few pretty public disputes with crypto protocols because he's trying to follow Wikipedia's rules on them. Only certain outlets are considered of an acceptable quality to be used as a citation in Wikipedia. And a lot of cryptocurrency projects get upset when that rule is enforced because they're not being covered in those outlets. That's not really a question. (laughs) Uh, I will say that David Gerard has been doing the Lord's work on Wikipedia when it comes to cryptocurrency. There are definitely entire groups of editors who just refuse to engage with anything cryptocurrency related because it is so unpleasant to deal with on Wikipedia. The, you know, people try to try to insert even, you know, they don't even always try to write a page about their project. They'll just try to like sneak something in somewhere about their project and like get some extra legitimacy from it being in Wikipedia. And David has been 
dealing with that for years now. So I, I just think it's another really good example of how willing these companies are to try to manipulate things so that they appear better than they are. And, and I think this kind of takes us back to our previous discussion on journalism and why it's so important for journalists to be unbiased and stuff. Because if you allow yourself to be compromised by the interests you're covering, then immediately the quality of your stuff's going to be compromised. And so that applies for the collaboratively edited encyclopedia that is Wikipedia that applies to journalism. And that's, I think, really one of the things at the heart of problems in crypto Web3 NFTs is that because everything is financialized and the entire philosophy is to financialize every interaction you make, their perception of reality is such that they believe that should be the way the real world should work, whereas most people in the real world tend to recoil a bit at that idea. Yeah, I've actually, that's been kind of a shocking thing to me with some, especially some of the earlier reception to the website is that just like assumption that I was going to make money off of it in some way. Uh, and I was like, what? No, wait, like, I'm just making my dumb little posts on my dumb little blog. I have no goals. You know, like I had someone who sent me a Twitter message the other day who was like, love your work, really cool stuff, excited to see how you're going to monetize it. And I was like, what? Like, no, that's not the goal. I feel like I've been clear about that from the beginning. Um, but people are like, but why Why wouldn't you? And it's like, I, I thought that was obvious. You know, I'm a Wikipedia editor and I have been for 15 years, like providing free knowledge is nothing new to me here but i think people just sort of expect that someone is grifting you know in one direction or the other and no one is you know objective and you know that's not to say i don't have a bias i clearly i do but it's not a financial one at least what you're getting at here is one of the reasons the web3 branding in particular makes my skin crawl because so much of the web in its history was built by people willing to contribute their thoughts, the things they create for free because they thought it was interesting or because they got other value out of sharing it. Like I've been blogging since I was a fifth grader and I've written tons of things without any expectation of ever getting paid for them because sharing my ideas was a thing I saw intrinsically valuable. And it's so disappointing to see so many people who seem to believe that the future of the web is one in which that concept no longer exists. I just want to quickly add on to that as well, that like the everyone talks about how decent the, the difference, one of the differences is like decentralization. And I think it's that's a really interesting point in terms of like, well, Wikipedia seems pretty decentralized and that's a bunch of people doing it voluntarily. And SETI at home, I don't know, maybe most listeners aren't familiar with that, but that was a the search for extraterrestrial life, extraterrestrial intelligence. That was all free as well, totally decentralized, Tor, free, decentralized. And I just wonder if people don't realize how much this, like, monetize everything, screws thing. it screws things up. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've noticed that with DAOs, you know, like, people talk about DAOs as being the, the future of these very, like, noble causes, you know, that they're trying to build these DAOs around. But it's like, as soon as you have... A group of people where some people are very motivated by, you know, supporting the project, whatever its goals are, you know, feed the hungry or whatever it is you're trying to do with your DAO. You know, some people are very invested in that and other people just want to make a buck off of it. You suddenly have two very competing sets of people where, you know, some people want to do what's best for the project and some people want to do anything that will in increase the price of the token. And there's not a great way to to handle that kind of a conflict because it's just two very divergent, usually, directions. And I think we saw that actually with, I mentioned the Wonderland DAO uh, not too long ago. This was a project that failed in a particularly spectacular way. Um, but at one point, one of the founders sort of reacted with shock that there were people who wanted to take their money out of the project be, and not like basically reinvest it or like contribute it towards the good of the project. And I thought that was so funny that like he is at one point promising to have this project where people will make tons of money and they'll become fabulously wealthy out of it. And then at the other, you know, on the other hand is like 
absolutely horrified when anyone dares to actually take their money out. And it's like, well, you've got two very different goals then. You either want people to support the project or you want people to make money. And those two things are not always in sync with one another. It's only when your project is doing very well that that actually makes sense. And, and it's especially hilarious that that specific project would have that reaction, considering it's the same project that had a felon and lifelong scammer on the multi-sig without telling anyone for an extended period of time. And so... Yes, true. It, it's a collection of bad actors being like, what do you mean you don't want to give us your money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That was shocking, wasn't it? And the I loved when they decided that they were going to sort of hand control over the treasury to sort of a, a whole group of other people behind other projects, some of which were also scams or some of which had been hacked, quote unquote, but like in ways that you kind of wonder maybe where that money was ending up in the end. I thought that was a, a funny uh, sort of gambit to try to save the project. Well, and then there was a whole other group of project participants who tried to start a vote to get the felon and lifelong scammer back on the treasury and back on the multi yes. which was just a incredible to watch from the sidelines as people were voting to put this guy back in control of what was originally billions and what ended up as millions after the market yes. crash of money. It's really funny to sort of watch some of these DAOs just act in ways that no one could possibly predict, including the people who created the projects. Um, there's there's no telling <laughs> what sort of the, the masses will decide. And I think that can be very funny sometimes. I think the uh, the last question that I wanted to ask you about, I think one of the main points that Web3 advocates like to talk about is that the difference between Web2 and Web3 is that Web3 is putting the power back in the people's hands, that it's changing everything because now, like, I, I don't know, own your data, some, something, right? I'm not, like, I'm not exactly sure here. But I think one of the points you're making is that that simply isn't the case and that Web3 for the most part, and maybe you can tell me if you have different perspectives in some sense, but uh, for the most part, seems to be taking advantage of the people more so than empowering the people. I think a lot of those promises don't stand up to scrutiny particularly well. The entire premise behind a lot of DAOs is whoever has the most money has the most power, which doesn't seem very freeing to me or very equalizing to me in the way that some people have tried to sort of present it. It's like, no, that's We've done that before and it was bad. Like, why do we want more of that? You know, the thing around owning your own data, I also find really interesting. I was listening to a conversation in like a Twitter space not too long ago with Kelsey Hightower speaking to a bunch of Web3 sort of proponents and, and trying to address some of the some of the concerns he has. First of all, the shocking thing to me was that the person who was talking started talking about how well, some people are using blockchains for purposes that they're really not intended for. And I was like, yes, this this is great. I agree. Can't argue with that. And so she kept going and talking about how, like, you know, you can't just use a blockchain to solve every problem. You know, not every thing is a nail when you're a hammer, et cetera, et cetera. And then she started to talk about something that she thought was a good use of the blockchain, which was storing medical records. And it was like this sort of record scratch moment <laughs> for me where I was like, hold on. <laughs> I was agreeing with you for a minute there. And then things just suddenly <laughs> took a turn. But anyway, the, the idea that she had was an, a noble idea, which was that, you know, you could, if you were invo involved in like a medical study and a, a company needed access to your medical records, then they could request access from you, they could pay you, and then you would grant them access through some system that apparently involved a blockchain. And then the idea was that at the end of the study, you could then revoke the access to your data from these companies so that they couldn't just reuse it again in their next study without paying you. And it's like, that's a great theoretical idea until you start to think about how like data works and the fact that like as soon as you have access to data, you have access to it forever. And there are definitely ways to put controls on data. The medical field knows this very well, obviously. You know, you can't just do anything with someone's medical data or you will face legal consequences. And it's like the blockchain is not the solution here. Regulation is the solution there. 
You know, there's not something about the blockchain that just makes data vanish from someone else's <laughs> hard drive when you revoke your permissions. So, you know, I think the idea that somehow this technology inherently solves these problems is sort of indicative of a, a broader problem in a lot of this sort of Web3 ethos, which is that somehow technology will solve social problems which has never been the case. It never will be the case. You know, there are technological portions of solutions, absolutely, but on its own, there's there's no way. Certainly true. And just before we wrap up, I just want to add, as a data scientist who works with billions of health records, please don't put them on the blockchain. You can't even get the top EMR makers to communicate with each other. What? This is this is an awful idea in every respect. Please don't try to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I so I wasn't speaking in that space. I was doing something else and couldn't sort of pipe up. But I was very, very curious after that revelation that that was the good idea to learn what the bad <laughs> ideas might be, because that seems like maybe the top choice for me. I think people just are like, well, straight up fraud is the only thing we need to be worried about. Just the straight up fraud <laughs> and the money laundering, like those might be the two issues we could be concerned about. It's not just like, well, also, for the most part, it doesn't solve any of the issues that you guys are talking about. I don't think that necessarily crosses most of these people's minds because like you said you know when when you're uh when you're a hammer every everything is a nail yeah absolutely although i think it may be a little bit generous to think that some people actually think that fraud is a bad thing because <laughs> in some of these conversations people are describing fraud or like well-known scam tactics and it's like that's a feature <laughs> that's something we can do now because we have blockchains and poor regulation so i don't know if there are actually that many people trying to trying to Get rid of that. Well, I, this has been a, a true pleasure. I'm so glad that you could join us. Is there anything that you would want to leave as like a lasting statement for our listeners for the time being? Uh, we obviously would love to have you on anytime. No, thank you for having me. I don't know. I mean, I feel like your your listeners probably tend towards the crypto skeptics, but if anyone out there is not as skeptical, then I would just encourage you to embrace the skepticism. You know, even if you are trying to build something on the blockchain or you think Web3 is the future, there's nothing to hurt you from listening to skeptics and critics like this. But then again, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably have already realized that. Well, if anyone is at all interested in how Web3 is not really going great, uh, please visit Molly's website, web3isgoinggreat.com, or again, her blog, which is also quite informative and that is updated relatively frequently. Um, so uh, yeah, visit either one of those, Mo uh, mollywhite.net for the blog. And yeah, appreciate you coming on. It was great. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I just have one issue that I need to address we get millions and millions of listens every week. Who wrote this copy? We don't get millions of listens every week. Okay, whatever. We get millions and millions of listens every week, but only 1% of you are subscribed. Who wrote this? I have no idea how many people are subscribed to our podcast. If you could subscribe, leave a rating and review, it could earn us up to $600,000. What are you talking about? What are you talking about?